those of you friends who are interested in Dhamma. Today we will study, examine, and investigate concerning the word love on the religious level. In Buddhism, it is popular to distinguish things on two levels. Whenever we examine or study something, we look at it on these two levels. The first is the household life, the level of the household life of homes and families. And then the second level is that which doesn't have anything to do with the, the household. So when we want to look at something, we look at it on both of these levels. Ordinarily, we just use the word love. But when it is mixed up with defilement and selfishness, then we call it raka or love. However, when it is spiritual, when it's under the guidance of mindfulness and wisdom, then we call it metta garuna, or for short, loving kindness. So we have these three different terms, love, lust, and loving kindness. We should we should be able to see how distinctly clear these different terms are. Ordinarily, people just play around with this word love. They don't look at it deeply or carefully. They just play with it or treat it very superficially. And so it is seldom properly understood. Please don't play with, with love because it is, it is something very profound, very hard to understand, almost mysterious. So we must be very careful to understand it properly. What we call love is the heart of religion, of culture, of ethics. But because we haven't managed it or adjusted it, adapted it properly, there are still many problems remaining in religion, culture, and ethics. we look at the world around us, that people are generally unable to love each other. And even when we look at religion, the different religions can't even smile together. There's no smiling between the religions. So even in, in this world, we still separate and break into parties and factions. In the ordinary world, people are unable to genuinely love each other. And even in religious matters, which is very, very sad, they're unable to love each other to even love up within the religions is something that is far from perfect. If we use love improperly, it becomes hot like a fire. If we use love correctly, it is cool like water. 
But if we misunderstand love, then it becomes just another kind of insanity. Therefore, let all of us do our best to understand love correctly. This is most appropriate in an era when the, lay, the, when the world is full of chaos, confusion, because people are unable to love each other. Please begin by clearly distinguishing between the, these three words we have mentioned. The lowest level is lust. The ordinary common level is love. And then the highest level is what we call loving kindness, metta. <clears throat> the difference is quite distinct. Actually, the difference is, is vast and also rather secret. So please examine this to see these differences. According to Dhamma principles, it's quite easy to distinguish these three words. <clears throat> if it's purely an instinctual thing, if it comes from the instincts and is merely instinctual, it is called Bema Bema in Pali, which is in Thai we can say Rap or English love. This is the ordinary instinctual level. When it has to do with the instinct, but this instinct has been developed in a defiled way so that it becomes a defilement, then in Pali it is called Kama or Raka, which in Thai we use the same words, which both of these essentially mean lust. This is when the instinct has been developed in a defiled way. If it has to do with the instinct which has been developed in an enlightened way, that, meaning, that means it's developed wisely then in the Pali language it's called metta, or in Thai, metta maitri, which has to do with friendship, friendliness, or it's often translated loving kindness. This is the third level or aspect of love. You by yourself can see clearly that there is the level which has to do with the has to do solely with the instincts and then there is the level that has to do with the instincts but they have changed into defilement and then there is the level having to do with the instincts which changes into enlightenment or wisdom. There are these three distinct aspects to love. Now we'll look at each of these in some detail. We'll examine the love which is purely instinctual, the instinctual love which has changed into defilement, and the instinctual love which has changed into enlightenment or enlightened love. We'll look at the 
the first one, the purely instinctual aspect, first. This merely instinctual level is occurs when there is no real understanding. There's just the instinct. There's no understanding, so we say there is moha. There is delusion. There is also upadana, attachment. Love is attached to as the lover, the beloved, and so on. So this, on this merely instinctual level, there is still delusion or attachment, or we can say in short, avicca, not knowing or ignorance. The instinctual level still contains a lot of attachment or upadana. This level can be quite powerful and strong to the degree that we would die for each other or one would die for each other. For example, a mother would die for her, her child just as we can see amongst animals. This is a way of measuring the, the strength of this instinctual love. It, it can have quite a bit of attachment to the degree that one would die for the thing one loves. So we call it Pema, the ordinary kind of love, which is full of moha, delusion, meaning that it isn't understood, it's lacking in mindfulness and wisdom. This love is quite strong, but it is not understood. The love of life the love of oneself. These are the fullest forms of Bema, and yet they are still full of Moha delusion. This kind of love is still mixed up with selfishness because it, it wants to get something. It wants to take or have something. It wants to receive something. And so this ordinary love is still mixed up with selfishness. So this ordinary level of love is still quite diluted or lacking in wisdom. It's not, it's not, you can't quite say that it's wrong, but you can't, nor can you say that it is good. It's neither wrong nor, nor good, it's just this ordinary peima that comes from or with moha, with not knowing, with lack of understanding, with delusion. Nonetheless, this kind of love is necessary. This instinctual love is necessary for reproduction. If we didn't have this kind of love, although it's still rather ignorant, there's nothing wise about it, if, we, if there wasn't this kind of love, then all the species would, would go extinct. So we should understand that although this love is still somewhat foolish or stupid, it still is necessary. Next we can look at the kind of love which comes from the instinct which has been developed into defilement. 
the original natural instinct can be changed through through ignorance into defilement. So this in, this defiled instinct has its own particular kind of love. Nature has arranged things so that there is this reproduction instinct. And then nature has arranged so that living things have sexual organs. And then when the glands or hormones reach a certain stage of maturity, then there are certain feelings and sensations which lead the instincts to the kind of love which, which is defiled. This love that comes from the defiled instincts has a great deal of moha that is, non-understanding, improper understanding, or delusion. And there's a lot of attachment mixed up with it as well. So even with this kind of love, one will die for the thing one loves. One People will die for each other because of the strength of the delusion and attachment. Although in, in these two cases one would die for the object of one's love, they're not the same. For example, when a mother dies for her child or a child dies for her or his mother, that's one, one level or one aspect, one way. But when a lover dies for his or her lover, that's a much different situation. Although both of them, both kinds of love, end in one dying for one, the object of one's love, there's quite a difference in the love itself. So now the pure instinctual love of Pema has trans been transformed into the lust which comes from the defiled instinct. So to see the difference between this ordinary instinctual love and lust will enable us to understand what we call love correctly. This love which comes from the defiled instincts is one that thinks only of getting, of taking, of receiving from the, from the other. This is a love where the delusion is very strong, the attachment is most powerful. And so this love is only thinking of getting, taking, receiving. In short, this lust is really just a form of insanity. You can call this the love which is lost its way because this love has become totally selfish. It's the love which is a lie. It's false love. It's the love that only wants to get, to take, to have, to receive. And so it's become a lie. It's just full of selfishness. It desires only to respond to this defilement. It's the love that is totally motivated by defilement. The world is undergoing all sorts of terrible problems because of this defiled love. There are all kinds of 
wicked crimes. There are lots of, there are people who kill each other and kill themselves. There are all kinds of insanities that are a result of this <clears throat> defiled love. And so we can say that this, this dishonest love, this lie of love is bringing about many crises in this world. Now we come to the third kind of love, the love that arises from the instincts which have been transformed into poti. Poti means awakening, enlightening. So these are the instincts which are transformed by wisdom, which brings us to a whole other kind <coughs> of love. Our instincts can develop in either way, in either a defiled or an enlightened way. So with children, we can see this very carefully. Depending on how they are raised, the instinctual love can develop in either direction. If children are raised correctly, if the parents know what they're doing, then the love of the child becomes more and more intelligent. And then it's very healthy for both the child and others. But if we raise our children foolishly, then this instinctual love becomes more and more selfish, more and more dangerous for the child as well as others. So mothers and fathers must be very careful. They must be responsible about this to make sure that the child's love develops in an enlightened way. When, when the surroundings are, are proper, when there is correct training, then the ordinary Pema is transformed into Metta. This can happen with the children as well as adults. Even Raka, even the lust, if it isn't too excessive, if it isn't too much, even this lust can be transformed into Metta. These things aren't fixed. They, they, are, they depend on the surroundings, the conditions, and how they are trained. None of these things are fixed, so the Pema can develop into either enlightened Metta or into defiled lust. It's not fixed, and so it there's always the chance to transform them into metta. Ordinarily, the enlightened love, intelligent, wise love of Bodhi doesn't need that one would die, doesn't require that we die for each other. Unlike the the other two kinds of love, the more foolish or even the stupid level of love. But in certain special circumstances, in certain very special situations, the conditions may require that one die for because of love. And so this self-sacrifice can happen even with the third kind of love, the metta that comes from with wisdom. When, due to appropriate reasons, out of this wise love of metta, 
one person may sacrifice his or her life for the benefit of many, for the benefit of the country or large numbers of people. When there are appropriate reasons, even this intelligent love can lead to self-sacrifice. But this is much different than the stupid self-sacrifice of ordinary love or the insane self-sacrifice of, of lust. One can die for what one loves on all of these levels, but the one is intelligent, one is foolish, and one is just flat out insane and ridiculous. There's <coughs> stories we read in the paper during World War II. We don't know if it's true or not, but it's quite interesting that during the Second World War, there were a single Japanese pilot in one plane, which carried a large bomb, would would deliberately crash or kamikaze into the British ships in Singapore. And so one, one man could take out an entire ship. This is, this is the result of this extreme self-sacrifice. And so this is how through intelligence one can know how to use a certain method to get such large results. In this kind of um, intelligent love, there's no thought of getting, of receiving. There is just a pure self-sacrifice. It's much different than the defiled love that thinks only of its own advantage and benefit, the selfish kind of love. So there's a great difference between the two. The, the instincts which have been transformed into poetry, the enlightened instincts, lead to what we call the Brahma Viharas, the dwellings, the highest dwellings, the Brahma dwellings, or the homes of the gods. These dhammas, or qualities, arise from the instinctual love that has been transformed in an enlightened way. These Brahma Viharas, these highest dwellings, have amongst them different levels, but all of them come from this enlightened, intelligent love. These Brahma Viharas, these highest dwellings of the mind, whether in the ancient times before the Buddha, or in later times, even in the present, as well as if these occur in the future, will always arise from the ordinary instinctual love, which has been transformed by poetry into enlightened love. Now we come to a certain perspective which must be examined. This is the fact that even this love is associated with atta, with self. If love is, is yet foolish, or if it's even stupid, the ordinary Pema or the defiled Raka, both of these kinds of love 
increase atta. They increase the sense of self and its strength. So if there is still ignorance, then this love becomes more and more selfish, and so it increases, it increases the self. However, if it's the love of, that comes from the enlightened instinct, then this is a love that decreases self. This enlightened, awakened love, this intelligent love, seeks to overcome selfishness. And so it lessens the self, it weakens the ego. This is the kind of love that wants to to overcome violence and conflict. And so it lessens the self and the selfishness. This kind of love has tremendous value. This is the love which is the basic foundation of all religion. This love that seeks to to weaken, to decrease the self and selfishness. We can probably say that human beings have thought up the way of practice called the Brahma Viharas, the development of these four divine dwellings. This is almost certainly the result of this this love that seeks to overcome the self, to weaken and decrease the self. In this essential religious impulse to weaken, to contain, restrain, and weaken the self, this has led to the idea of practicing the four Brahma Viharas. If we study the history of religion in India, if we read the old sacred texts that describe the evolution of religion in India, we'll see that the practice of going off into the forest to develop the Brahma Viharas preceded all the all the religions. This came before the systematized religions. The hermits, the recluses, the sages would go off to meditate on these these four Brahma Viharas. This was done with the belief that after death they would go to live <coughs> as a Brahma god in some other, some Brahma world somewhere. Through this belief, they developed these practices long, long ago. And then this knowledge has been passed on from generation to generation from, from way back, way back then. And it has become an ancient tradition which was passed along into the Hindu tradition and it even was passed along into Buddhist times. And then Buddhism accepted it as this ancient tradition which had been handed down. And then it has still been handed down until today. This is called Sanantana Dhamma. The, an ancient tradition which has been handed down since before we can remember. So in Buddhism, the Brahma Viharas are accepted as Sanantana Dhamma, as an ancient tradition. And it has the highest value in, its highest benefit is in that it overcomes 
all malice, all enmity, any, any thoughts of vengeance, of, of malice are done away with by these, by these four Brahma Viharas which have been handed down since ancient times. There is no real peace in this world because these four Brahma Viharas are, are lacking. And so this world is full of crime, competition, aggression, and conflict. There are all kinds of disputes and conflicts between employers and employees because, because they lack these Brahma Viharas. As soon as the employers have these Brahma Viharas and the employees too, then all the disputes and in industrial problems and labor problems will be ended when there are these Brahma Viharas overcoming all, all malice, anger, and enmity. The Brahma Viharas, these most excellent loves, have been, have been taught in all the religions. It's a basic foundation in all religion that there are these excellent forms of love. And it's more profound than often people think because most religions teach that these Brahma Viharas are not for just among human beings, but they apply also to animals as well. <clears throat> In our relation with animals, we should depend upon the Brahma Viharas. And there are even some religions, some religious sects that say even, that teach that the Brahma Viharas apply also to plants. Plants are living things, and so we should deal with them with these four Brahma Viharas. This is more or less the case in Buddhism for the monks, the bhikkhus, fully ordained monks. One of the training rules is forbids us to damage a living plant. And so this, this principle of Brahma, of practicing the Brahma Viharas towards all living things is, exists in Buddhism also. It's important, it's necessary that each of you reflect upon examine and, and deeply consider how we are to use the Brahma Viharas in this modern world of ours so that we, there can be peace. Each of us must ask ourselves and deeply ponder how we can bring peace into this world how we can adapt and apply the Brahma Viharas so that there will be peace. If we are unable to extend this, these most excellent loves to all things, if we don't, we're not yet able to love each other, or we can't extend this love to animals, and to plants, then we must first train to master our minds. If we can master our minds in the highest way, such as through practicing mindfulness with breathing, <clears throat> then it will be possible, it will be easy to have the Brahma Viharas towards all people, towards all living things. But first we must 
master our minds if we are to do this. Next we'll look at the question, whose duty is it to to bring these Brahma Viharas to the modern world? If we look at things on the political level, we see that the politicians totally lack the Brahma Viharas. In social matters, in social functions which we organize and set up, we, we hardly ever think of the Brahma Viharas. We think about the benefits we will get, the material advancement, the technological progress, the development, and so on. But in all of our social organizations and systems and functions, we hardly ever consider these four excellent loves. And so in the end, it's full, the social things are full of competition, there's lots of crime and corruption, and people even end up killing each other. In economics and industry, they only think of increasing their own benefit, increasing one's own profit. Nobody thinks in economics and industry, they, they don't ever consider the Brahma Viharas. It's, they don't have the numbers, these don't fit into their little equations. They only think in terms of personal profit and advantage. Or in the cooperative movements, in these cooperative organizations, the majority of people are thinking of just getting something out of it. They're primarily interested in their personal benefit. So the cooperatives aren't founded in the Brahma Viharas and the majority of them fail. Or those that still exist are full of corruption and injustice. And we should look at the last thing at religion. The religions can't even smile together. The re different religions think only of converting people to their own religion, of taking over the world so that the whole world follow, belongs to just one religion. With, in these kinds of religions, in this sort of religion, that thinks only of competition and conquest, there are none of these Brahma Viharas, there is no, there is no real love. And so the religions can't smile together, they can't cooperate, they just create more problems for, for the world. And if this is the case even with religion, then on what is the world going to rely, to what? Where is the world going to find any refuge? So in the end, we're left with ourselves. Since we can't depend on the politicians, the economists, the industrialists, or even the, the, the organized religions, all we can depend on are ourselves. It's up to each of us to to develop, to bring the Brahma Viharas into the world by developing our minds, especially through practicing mindfulness with breathing. We'll have the mastery over our minds that will enable us to have the Brahma Viharas. When we've trained our minds well enough, the Brahma Viharas will be will be no problem. And so in the end, you, you can't look to somebody, to anybody else to bring about these Brahma Viharas, to bring peace into the world. It's up to each of us to practice, to master our own minds so that we have the Brahma Viharas. To make this development easier, 
we're going to examine the benefits or the results received from having the Brahma Viharas. It helps if we we understand the benefits that naturally arise from having the these four excellent loves. The one excellent benefit that we can all easily realize is that the Brahma Viharas will eliminate selfishness from this world. Through the Brahma Viharas we can eliminate selfishness. The very intense and strong selfishness in the people of this this planet, of this world, is now challenging religion. This very intense selfishness in modern people means that people laugh at, have no respect for religion. They consider it something silly and worthless because their minds are so dominated with, with selfishness. But through the Brahma, and so now religion has this great competitor, or we could even say enemy, in this intense selfishness of modern humanity. But these Brahma Viharas can weaken, decrease, and eliminate that selfishness so that we can even call it the highest grace for humanity when humanity can be freed of this very terrible and destructive selfishness. With less selfishness this world will cool down. The less selfishness there is, the the more the world will cool off instead of all the heat that's being generated by competition, aggression, violence, and selfishness. Back in the old days, in the ancient times when civilization wasn't near so developed, things were much cooler. There was far less anxiety and war because people hadn't yet gotten so obsessed with material comfort, with luxury, with technology, with pillaging the earth in order to to have material progress, technological development. So through the Brahma Viharas, overcoming selfishness, so we can get out of these cycles of competition, aggression, violence, and destruction of the environment, then the world will have a chance to cool down, to cool off. It's it's rather funny that the world that didn't know how to make ice back in the days before they had refrigerators, when they couldn't make ice, it was colder than the times when the world knows how to make ice. Now we've got refrigerators and freezers and air conditioners all over the place, but the world is hotter than before we had these things. In the past, we didn't know how to make ice, but there was a lot more peace than in these days where we can make as much ice as we want, but we can't make peace. If the people from the ancient times, from long, long ago, even when people weren't wearing clothes, if we go back, if one of these people came to see our modern world and saw our, you know, all this electricity and our, all this recording equipment and our technology, they would, they would have great respect for these achievements of humanity. They would respect us um, and even honor us. But then when they looked around, started to look for peace and couldn't find any, 
when they saw that in this modern technological world there's almost no peace anymore. They w then they would laugh in our faces. They would laugh so hard their teeth would fall out. The more selfish we are, the more we lack the Brahma Viharas. And the more we lack the Brahma Viharas, the less there is peace. Please examine these three things together. That as selfishness increases, the Brahma Viharas decrease. And as the Brahma Viharas decrease, so peace cannot be found, peace disappears. You should understand this connection well and then do whatever we can to increase the Brahma Viharas so that we can have peace in our world. In Buddhism, people like to speak about the world of Si Arya Mitraya Buddha, the Buddha of universal love and compassion. In Christianity, there's the second coming of the Messiah that will bring, will bring universal love. In, in the Hindu tradition, they speak of the coming of Kalki, it has, which has the same meaning as pra in Thai pra si Arya Mitrai, or the Mitraya comes from the word friendliness or love. This is traditionally thought of as the Buddha of universal love. These, these worlds that people all over the world are looking forward to will never come as long as we are living selfishly. As long as each of us permits ourselves to, to be selfish, as long as each of us is still weak in the Brahma Viharas, then there's no way that the Messiah will return or that the Buddha of universal love will, will come. But as soon as, but when we overcome selfishness and fully develop the Brahma Viharas, then the Buddha of universal love will appear naturally. So this is a kind of scrutiny, a detailed, subtle investigation of the different meanings of love, which we must do. It's very important that we scrutinize this carefully in order to see the, the proper differences in distinctions so that it will enable us to solve the problem of love to transform love into the form that is beneficial for the world. The lowest level of love, that of Raka, is to love with Kamupadana, which means attachment to sensuality. When love is when we love with sensuous attachment, then it is such as with young people, when young men and women are in love with all kinds of sensual, sexual desire. That is this lowest form of love. Then the ordinary, natural kind of love is still mixed up with atawa dupadana, attachment to I and mine, attachment to self. Ordinary love still happens through this attachment. In the love there is still the me and mine. So we should examine it carefully to see both its good side and its bad side, the, the pluses and the minuses. For example, how the love of parents for children to see 
what kind of results it brings, or the love of a teacher for her or his students, to see that there are benefits, but there are also problems, as long as love is concerned with attachment to self, attachment to to me and mine. Although it's better than the low the lower form of love, there's still a certain amount of burden and heaviness as long as there's attachment to self. And then the highest form of love we would like to say is love through dam Dhammupadana, Dhammupadana, or attachment to Dhamma, the love that comes from and with attachment to Dhamma. But let us be honest and say that this word Dhammupadana is, you can't, you won't find it in the Pali scriptures. In fact, it's a word that we've just made up. Um, some people will criticize us for doing so. But you can, there is such a thing, although the word doesn't appear in the, the old book. But there's a kind of love that comes from attachment to what is correct, to genuine, when, when we see that we are all comrades in birth, aging, illness, and death when we see that it is necessary and correct to work together to help each other, when we attach to this correctness, to what is right, what to what needs to be done, we can call that dhamupadana. When there is this dhamupadana motivating the love, then this gives us the, the third kind. Please don't forget that we made this word up ourselves, but nonetheless, it, it points to a reality. Let's repeat this once again. Um, youth, young men and women, love each other with gamupadana, attachment to sensuality, to sex. Parents love their children with the love of atavadupadana, which is attachment to self, to I and mine. And then pure love, the love of friends, those who are kin, are kindred in birth, aging, illness, and death. This pure kind of love is through dhamupadana attachment to Dhamma. Next we'd like to consider relationship, the way we are related. One kind of relationship is the relationship through, through lust, the relationship through selfish desire, through ignorance, through attachment. This is one kind of relationship. The other sort of relationship is the relationship that is free of delusion, free of, of ignorance. It's not, it's unselfish, and there's no attachment. There's non-attachment. Both are ways or means or kinds of relationship but they're totally different. One is very heavy. It's full of problems and pain. The other kind of relationship is light, free, and very good. Now even the Brahma Viharas can go astray. If there's not proper mindfulness and wisdom, we're not really aware and understanding, then the Brahma Viharas can lead to involvement or to, to being caught up or bound up in something. 
So when the Brahma Viharas are not pure, it can lead to heaviness in problems just the same. But when the Brahma Viharas are, are pure, there isn't this invo- attached involvement. There's nothing that ties one up. One isn't tied down by it. So there's nothing heavy or oppressive when the Brahma Viharas are pure. So even the Brahma Viharas have their pure and unpure form, the results of which are quite different. Our love of husband, wife, children, parents, even our love for our our pets, for most of us this love has ties. There are ties that that bind us in these these forms of love. And so they lead to problems, to friction, to pain and suffering. But the love of the noble ones, the noble ones with in their love there are no ties. Nothing we're not tied together. There's no trap in the love. And so it's totally free. It's totally independent, light. There's nothing heavy or burdensome about that kind of love. So the true Brahma Viharas, the pure Brahma Viharas, are the forms of love that lead to the overcoming of selfishness, the lessening and the ending of selfishness. If they're true Brahma Viharas, then self will be steadily overcome. But when they're false Brahma Viharas, when they're, then they're full of I and mine. And then in the end, they never, they never set us free. Now this I and mine, me and mine kind of Brahma Viharas This kind of love may go back to the ancient times. But then it was steadily improved. And then when we find it in Buddhism, or maybe in when it appears in Christianity, if it's the pure form of the Brahma Viharas, then it overcomes the I and mind. It's a way of letting go of self and of selfishness. If if it's the Brahma Viharas are not yet pure, they're still mixed up with attachment, then there will still be problems. But when there's no more attachment, then there's no more problem. So even what we call love, if it still has problems, if our love is still troublesome or problematic, then it's not yet good enough. It's not yet really love. So love must be free of problems. We must know how to love so that it doesn't create any trouble for for anyone. In short, we can express this in just a few words. The kind of love that still bites its owner is not the Brahma Viharas. The love that doesn't bite its owner, these, this kind of love can be called the Brahma Viharas. So any sort of love that is still biting its owner should not be considered the highest kind of love or true love but the kind of love that doesn't bite anybody. This is the meaning of the Brahma Viharas. Now you ought to be able to tell the difference because each of you has experienced both (coughs) kinds of love. You've experienced the love that is turned around and bit you, but you've also experienced the kind of love that didn't bite you, that didn't turn on you. If it still bites us, then it's not the Brahma Viharas, but the love that doesn't bite anyone or anything, 
This is the Brahma Viharas. Please know how to discriminate correctly between these two kinds of love. It's very important that we can tell the difference, that we understand the difference deeply. Or another way of putting it, the love that brings peace is the Brahma are the, is the Brahma Viharas. The love that just that doesn't bring peace, that just brings more more problems, more confusion, more turmoil. That is not the Brahma Vihara. So what kind of our love, what kind of love does our world have now? If it isn't yet correct, then hurry up and straighten out the problem. Hurry up and improve love so that it's the kind that we need. If to have the real, genuine Brahma Viharas, it's necessary to develop our minds, to train our minds through mindfulness with breathing. Once we have sufficient mastery over our minds, we can choose without any trouble the right kind of love. It won't be a problem. There won't be any difficulty in having the right kind of love once we've trained our minds properly. Please don't, don't waste any time in doing so. So whether in your study, your investigation of dependent origination, or in your practice of mindfulness with breathing, may it always lead, may it ever lead to more, more full and correct Brahma Viharas, that you will get the true benefit from what is called Dhamma or what we call religion. So thank you for listening. You've taken quite a bit of patience and endurance. If it's been difficult for you, we ask your forgiveness. But we hope that you will be able to practice Dhamma in the way that we have discussed. We hope that you have the greatest success in doing so. Thank you. And that ends today's talk.